hey everyone again. Um, today I'll be talking about uh, deep learning and specifically deep learning with H2 Hydrogen Torch and I will tell you what it is in, in a minute. So to start with a couple of words about me, uh, I work at H2 AI for uh, three years and I work at the Prague office, so I've moved to Prague three years ago. And my main focus at H2 is deep learning and specifically computer vision applications. Uh, and for the last year, we will build, build a product, H2 Hydrogen Torch, uh, that I will be talking about today. And apart from that, I am also a Kaggle Competitions Grandmaster. So if you have heard about Kaggle, it is a machine learning platform uh, where uh, you could uh, compete for some prizes and some medals. And I have like 10, 10 gold medals there. And it includes different data types, so including tabular data, text data, images, audios. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's it. Um, so here's a quick agenda for today. We will start with a discussion what Hydrogen Torch is. Then we will uh, dig into one deep learning uh, topic and one uh, problem type that is called image object detection. And we will see, uh, we will have some kind of hands-on session on how you would build a, an object detection model uh, in general and then how you'd like to, to deploy this model to the production environment. So let's start with uh, what is H2 Hydrogen Torch. So in a nutshell, it is a no-code deep learning platform that allows you to train deep learning models uh, without a line of code. So all you have to do is uh, just to go to, to the UI, adjust some settings, and uh, train and deploy deep learning models without, without any, 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 any code. And our uh, target audience for this tool is kind of broad. So we aim in uh, as for junior data scientists, where uh, we're allowing them to start training deep learning models uh, like in a second, right? Because you have just UI and you, you could click uh, tra train the models and obtain some deep learning models out of the box. But at the same time, we're also aiming uh, at their super experienced deep learning engineers. And the goal uh, for them is to give a tool that has all their uh, settings available explicitly for you to tune. So it means that we're uh, allowing you to customize all the possible settings you would like to change for building a good deep learning model. And you have everything in your hands. And it is, it is much faster than building pipelines uh, with, with the code. And in Hydrogen Torch, we support uh, a dozen of problem types. And it covers uh, three data types, images, text, and audios. So we are uh, tailored towards their unstructured data. Uh, and it starts from simple classification and regression for all these data types towards some specific use cases like this detection or segmentation for the images. Uh, or for the text, it might be talking classification, sequence to sequence, or metric learning, for example. And today, I will be mostly talking about image object detection. And the definition of this problem type is pretty straightforward. So we have an input image, and we need to output a set of predicted objects on this image. So in this case, if we would have two classes, uh, dogs and cats, we would like to detect all the dogs and cats and uh, draw a box around, around each object. So at, an output of this model is a set of detections where we put the labels of the class and also their uh, bounds and box location of, of, of this box. And the complication of this problem type compared to uh, simple classification, image classification, is that now, apart from doing just uh, telling what, what's uh, on the image, we, we need to, uh, to tell what is the location of, of, of this object. And for uh, the presentation today, I will be uh, using a simple car detection data set uh, so here we have uh, uh, images that are taken from the traffic cameras installed, I guess, in, in the United States. And uh, here we have bouncing boxes around all the cars that are passing by uh, through these cameras. So, so th there could be some intersections of the roads, there could be just roads. And for this particular data set, you might uh, imagine like a couple of different use cases. So for example, you would like to estimate is there traffic jam, jam now uh, in this particular location, or you want to estimate how many cars are passing by through this particular intersection, or you would like to uh, estimate uh, or change their uh, working, working hours of your uh, traffic lights and, and, and so on. Um, and to start building the models, the first thing that, that you're doing locally, right, once you have the data set, is to build the, the, valida the validation setup. And the most popular choice is cross-validation. So here we split the data into multiple faults and train multiple models for each fault, and then we obtain kind of uh, the combined metric all, all over our, our trained data set. However, cross-validation is not really a good idea for deep learning because uh, there we might have really long experiments, so they could take hours or days. And if we'd like to change uh, for, for each experiment, if we'd like to, to run the whole cross-validation setup, it might take really long time to, to optimize the models. That is why in deep learning we are mostly using a kind of holdout uh, sets, right? So j just sim simple fault. And this particular data set, I've split it into 
two, two parts, validation and test data, and taking 15% for each, for each of them. Uh, and uh, it is also split by, by unique um, uh, cameras. So, so the idea is that we do not want to overfit to a single camera, uh, for, to a single camera view, but we rather want to build a generalizable model that generalizes across, across cameras. And this particular data set is pretty small, so it has only 3,000 images, and a uh, majority of them has uh, a resolution of 4, 4, 480 by 720 pixels. And the metrics that we will be trying to optimize uh, is called mean average precision at 0.7 IOU threshold. And it is, it is a bit cryptic, but uh, we'll talk about it in detail here. So firstly, we need to, to, to know what, what's intersection over union. And it is the major metric that is used to evaluate the quality of your detected boxes. So here, for example, in the image, you could see uh, the ground truth box around, around the dock. It is, it is this, this green uh, bounding box. And for example, we have our blue prediction uh, somewhere around the, the, uh, the, the dock. And this metric is just, uh, as it says, we just take the area of intersection of these two boxes and divide it by the area of the union of, this, of these two boxes. And so the better we match their uh, boxes, the closer this metric to one. And in this particular case, this metric is 0.71. And the mean average precision is kind of the most popular metric that is used to evaluate object detection models. And it consists of two parts, so average precisions and mean. So first of all, we are calculating average precision across all our cl classes in the data set. And afterwards, we're taking the mean over all the average precisions. And to calculate average precision for a single class, what we are doing is we're taking all our predictions. So in this case, let it be a class doc. And we take all our boxes and sort them by the confidence. So it means that we take uh, uh, our whole test data set, we, take, we make predictions, and we take all these predictions and sort them by, by confidence. And afterwards, uh, we go them, uh, through them one by one, and we're trying to match them to some ground, ground truth boxes. And we are doing this matching uh, by using intersection over union. So for example, we take our most confident box with, with confidence 0.99. And uh, we, we'd like to, to find at least one ground truth box with intersection over union, for example, over 0.7. And in this case, if, if there is a match, uh, then uh, we are making a, uh, one dot on our precision recall curve here, here at the bottom. Uh, then we, we are going to our second confident box. We are again matching it to some uh, ground truth boxes. And if it is, then, then we are again making, making, a plot, uh, making a point in the plot. And so on and so forth. So sometimes we might miss some boxes. Sometimes we, we are making matches. And our precision and recalls uh, are changes o o over these predictions. And the average precision is just uh, the area under this curve. So we're uh, connecting all the dots that, that we have seen. And afterwards, we're calculating the area under this curve, and it is our average precision. And afterwards, as I said, if we have multiple classes, we just take uh, average of, of these average precisions, and we obtain our mean average precision score. Um, all right. Uh, so first of all, once we have the validation set up, we need to, to build, build their uh, baseline model. So for this purpose, I will quickly go to their tool itself, to our H2 Hydrogen Torch. And I will start uh, with this page. So it is our uh, cloud platform at h2.ai. And also we have a public, publicly available cloud that you could, you could go to our website, sign up, and, and use it for free, uh, I guess, for, 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 for 90 days. And then you could, there you could also try all these all this applications. And H2 Hydrogen Torch is one, one, of, one of such applications. And uh, he, here you could, you could start, start instances of, of this application. And I have already have uh, uh, one running here. So I, I can click, click Visit. And here you are going to the main screen of H2 Hydrogen Torch. And the whole UI here is written with, with pure Python. And in the next talk, Mar Martin will, will tell, tell about uh, the framework that, that we used uh, here. So it is called Wave. And the whole UI is, is, uh, is built in Python. And here you could see the, the usual workflow you would like to, to take in any uh, machine learning building build process. So you import the data set, you're creating the experiment, and then you, you're uh, deploying the model. So in this case, I have already imported this, this traffic cameras data set. So you could take a look at uh, sample visualizations. So, so it is exactly what we have seen in the slides. So we have just a single class, and we have bouncing boxes around, around the cars. Uh, once you have the, the data set, you can click New Experiment and create a new experiment in, in, in um, a Hydrogen Torch. So here at the top, uh, you're seeing their experience level. Uh, it is a nice feature that allows you to uh, kind of specify your level in deep learning. So if you treat yourself as a, as a novice uh, deep learning engineer, then we will hide all their settings from you, and we will leave uh, only the most important ones. So in this case, you would choose only the architecture for the object detection and the number of epochs. And the rest is kind of defaulted to pretty good default values. And it, it means that even with these default values, you could obtain pretty, pretty good model. 
However, if you treat yourself as a master deep learning engineer, then we're exposing you all the possible settings uh, that you, you, you might want to tune. So firstly, we are starting with some image settings, so you can specify the image width and height, the number of channels and normalization. Then we have settings for the augmentations. Uh, we have the settings for the architecture, and now it is not only the, the selection of the, of the backbone architecture, but rather in this case, it is, it is efficient that architecture. So we have like, an, uh, uh, you might select the number of anchors, you might select their anchor aspect ratios, and so on. Uh, and on top of this, we have all the training settings. So you could select the optimizer, you could specify the learning rate, batch size, number of epochs, and, and so on and so forth. And uh, apart from that, we also have the environment settings uh, where you could specify as a number of GPUs you'd like to train on. So this particular instance has only a single GPU, but if you have a multi-GPU machine, then we are doing training on, in multi-GPU fashion. And it is done in distributed data parallel mode in, in, in PyTorch. And also, all the training is done in mixed precision. So, so uh, we, are, uh, we are using Float16 uh, like calculations for all the models inside, inside the tool. And also, you could specify, for example, the number of workers you, you'd like to use uh, on, your, on your machine. So yeah, so once you have selected all the settings, uh, all you have to do is just click Run Experiment, and it will start, start, start a new experiment here, here uh, in the tab. Uh, so here, here we have the set, set running right now, and I have one pre-run pre experiment for this data set. And yeah, it looks a bit scaled, but it is due, due to the screen. So the, there, uh, here you can see the view of, of the experiment. So firstly, we are showing some charts. In this case, we are showing learning rates and training and validation losses, and also the validation metrics that we are optimizing it, it, is this mean average precision. Apart from that, you could see also train data insights. And here we are showing the images that are uh, output from our augmentations, and it just to make sure that your augmentations are correct and that they make sense to you. And also we have validation prediction insights, where we are showing our uh, true boxes together with our predictions. So in this case, you, uh, you could see on the left our, our true boxes for this particular image, and on the right are our, our predictions. And also, you could see the, the, the confidences for each prediction. And here you could adjust these this, this, uh, plots like dynamically, so you could, you could change the threshold, and of course, if you increase the threshold, you would see uh, less boxes. If you decrease the threshold, you might have much more false positive boxes here. And once you have this uh, baseline experiment, uh, you, could, you, you could improve the models. So I will, I will go back to the slides, and we'll show you. Here was our, uh, was our baseline model. Uh, we use the image size of 256 by 384 pixels. It has the same aspect ratio as the majority of the images in the train data set, but much lower resolution. Uh, the architecture is efficient that with efficient net B0 backbone. Uh, yeah, here is the learning rate and number of epochs. And we see that this, this metric that we're trying to optimize is 0.27 for validation and 0.31 for test. And the metric range is from 0 to 1, and the, the higher the better. But this 0.3 score is, is already pretty good for, for the first baseline experiment. And on the right, uh, you could see the, uh, the metric that, that is growing of, 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 from one epoch to another, and it, uh, it has a pr pretty nice uh, upward trend. And here you can see also the, the predictions of the baseline models that we have recently seen. And they, they're already make, making pretty, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good uh, job here. And uh, it is also an important thing, once you're try trying to build a computer vision model, it is important to look into your data and to look into, into your predictions. Because uh, just looking at the metric, that, that doesn't make sense uh, once uh, your, uh, your boxes are like far away or if uh, there are like a bunch of other false positive boxes and so on. So it is uh, usually a, a good idea to also look into, into your predictions. And now once we have this baseline model, we'd like to improve it. And of course, uh, it is kind of like endless process, right? So, so you, you, you might improve, improve your, your, your models forever. And I have split uh, their hyperparameters for deep learning models to tuning into two groups. So here on the left is their parameters that are kind of like more general and that you would like to change to uh, get a better uh, quality models. So they include, for example, architecture, augmentations you'd like to, to, to obtain, uh, to, to apply to your images, the image size, and also maybe less important, like loss optimizer, maybe learning rate scheduler, and so on. And on the right are the settings that you would like to tune together with, with this with this architecture and augmentations, for example. And the idea here is that if you if you're changing their uh, architecture uh, and maybe uh, 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 you're changing the augmentations in, in your data set, uh, then some, some architectures require completely different learning rates. And it means that you can't compare two models head to head with the same learning rate. So after you change the architecture, you need to retune your models and try to adjust and find the optimal learning rate, the optimal batch size, and, and the number of epochs. So it means that if you're changing one, one thing on the left, 
then you subsequently need to, to retune your models or with, 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 with these uh, things uh, on the right. And today I will just uh, focus on uh, uh, a couple of settings from here. So we'll try to change architecture at, and augmentations. And we will uh, retune it with change in learning rate and number of epochs. And we'll keep the batch size, the image size, and all the other settings fixed for, for, uh, for the sake of, of, of the presentation. Um, all right. So now let's talk about object detection architectures. Here on the slide, you could see their, uh, one of the most important uh, benchmarks for their object detection models. Uh, and it is done on the COCO dataset. On the x-axis, you could see their time progression. So it starts from, from, from year 2015 towards uh, like uh, uh, year 2022. And you could see uh, how the metric w was progressing over the time. And here with uh, yellow errors uh, is available architectures in Hydrogen Torch. So we support uh, three different families of architectures. So first of all, we, we support their classic faster RCNM uh, architecture. And it is a two-stage detector that was out like back in, in 2016, but still is doing pretty, pretty, pretty good job because it is, uh, uh, it has a two-stage nature. Apart from it, we have also a, an architecture called Efficient Debt, and it is a one-stage detector uh, that was also a state-of-the-art for, for, uh, for quite uh, some time. Uh, and both of these architectures, FastRCNN and Efficient Debt, are using anchors to build, uh, 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 to, uh, to build predictions for, uh, for your models. Uh, however, there are also like a separate branch of research in object detection area that is kind of, kind of like anchor-free models. And one of them is FCOS that we also have in, 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 in Hydrogen Torch. And its idea is uh, tailored towards uh, not making the predefined like anchors on, on, on your images, but rather use some kind of like key point estimation or semantic segmentation architectures that allows you to estimate your objects without any predefined boxes in advance. And the current state of the art, so if you look at the, at the top, top right of this chart, is, uh, it is our, uh, our state of the art at the moment. And if you could see here, uh, like, uh, there is a, a, an ar architecture that is called SWIN, and it stands for, for, for shift, shifted windows. And it is a transformer-based architecture. And transformer is this architecture that is now widely used in NLP models. So, so if you have heard uh, about some BERT models or, or, or something like this for NLP, all of them are based on transformers. And initially, it was uh, po popularized for the NLP area. But now, these transform models are also kind of like squeezing in a computer vision area. And now, the majority of their uh, computer vision benchmarks are also dominated by these tra transformers models. Um, all right. So here, uh, ju just as a, a short uh, wrap up of uh, how we're selecting the architecture. So we have these three options uh, with efficient debt, FCOS, and faster CNN. And we run a couple of experiments to estimate the best uh, architecture for this particular data set. And here you can see that faster SN is winning by a large margin, right? So, so uh, it already has a metric of 0.6 compared to our original baseline 0.3. And to run this, uh, like to obtain these uh, this results, we've run not just three experiments, right? Like to, to one experiment for each architecture. But we've actually run 16 experiments because, as I said, you need to retune your learning rate for each architecture. So if you change the architecture, you need to also adjust the learning rate for each of them. Uh, and here you could see the, the validation plot of this mean average precision metric. And uh, there is uh, one slight drop in the, in, in, uh, in the last epoch. So, so if you could see it from the fourth to fifth epoch, we, our metric is slightly decreasing. But we are not choosing this pre-last uh, epoch, but we, we are rather cho uh, choose, cho choosing the last epoch. And the reason for that is that uh, it is a bad idea to apply early stopping in deep learning models. Because if you apply, uh, and not, not only in deep learning, but in general, because if you apply early stopping, uh, then you're kind of overfitting to your validation data set. And it means that all your scores will be kind of over, 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 uh, over optimistic uh, compared to, to, to your test data set. And the uh, ideas that, that, that we, we are trying to, to kind of, uh, the goals that we're trying to, to achieve here is to make sure that our last epoch is, uh, is, is the best one, or at least one of the best ones. So we're trying to tune our model in, this, in such a manner that uh, it, it converges in, at the very end to, 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 the best, to the best result. So it means that we don't, we don't, now, we don't rely on this early stopping and we, we are not overfitting to our validation data set. Um, all right, so apart from the uh, object detection architecture, we have also a selection for, for the backbones. So it means that object detection architecture is just a set of uh, layers on top of some backbone architecture. But still, there is a wide selection of uh, like conventional neural networks that you could apply to extract features from your images. 
And here you could see the comparison of different fam families on this particular data set. So uh, uh, there are dense nets, as ResNet, ResNet, and the best architecture was NFNet, and it stands for uh, normalization-free networks. And it is, it is a pretty recent paper, I guess it is from, from, from the last year. And what it, uh, what it does is it basically takes the ResNet architecture, pretty, pretty famous architecture, but eliminates all the batch normalization layers. So it means we're, we're not uh, making any normalizations there. And it, it allows us to, to, to improve the quality of, of such models and also eliminate the effect of normalization in, in the training. And here we have run also 27 experiments to get, to get the best, be, be, best architecture for, uh, for this backbone. And one, one, one more thing that, that we'll try to optimize is augmentations. So augmentations is uh, the technique that allows us to uh, generate more data on the fly. So we take our input images, we uh, change them, th them a bit, and pass them, them to the network. And its goal is to make the network like to learn different, different images at, at different, uh, like, with different augmentations and to make it more, more generalizable. And augmentations consists of two, two kind of like families. So the first one is just usual augmentations you would like to, 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 to apply. So it could be like some flips, some rotations, maybe shifts. And in, in Hydrogen Torch, we have like three predefined strategies, like soft, medium, and hard. And you could, you, uh, you could just cl click, uh, click and choose them. And like the soft means that you were doing some, some kind of a couple of flips, but medium and hard, we are doing like harder, harder augmentations. And apart from this, uh, there is a, and also a family of mixed augmentations. And here on the right top, you could see their um, image from the, uh, 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 from, from the paper as, as it is called uh, YOLO v4. And there they have introduced uh, the new, uh, new mix augmentation called Mosaic. So beforehand, we have mix up and cut mix augmentations. And what they do is we take two images together. And in the mix up augmentations, we are finding the weighted average of the two images. So basically, we're just stacking them together, overlaying one under, under another, and uh, passing it, this to the network. And it allows uh, to, to improve the quality of the models. There, another approach is cut mix. So there, we're just cutting and cropping some regions of one image and pasting it into, into the another image. And in YOLO paper, uh, they, they have introduced the architecture called Mosaic. And in this case, we take multiple images, we stack them all together, and you could see that uh, here in the single image, we might have like four different images. And it, from, what, what, uh, like, from the first glance, it, it might, might not make sense, right, that we're just like mixing up too, too many different stuff. But if you look at, at our examples on, uh, like, uh, uh, at, the, at the bottom from our data set, it might actually ma make sense, right? Because we're kind of combi uh, combining multiple parts of the roads from different like, light conditions, from different, uh, di different intersections. And uh, we might uh, like, allow the model to, to generalize better to, 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 uh, to, dif uh, to different cameras. And in this particular data set, uh, their best augmentations uh, th th uh, that worked uh, was mix-up augmentation. And it is this mix-up augmentation that, as I said, like just a weighted average of two, two images. So you could see that some images might, might be messy now. Uh, and uh, there are sometimes cars in the field, right, that, 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 do not make, uh, uh, that doesn't, doesn't make sense. But sometimes it is re uh, really good augmentations where just may maybe imitating some rush hours where you have really a bunch of cars in the center of the, of the, of the road intersection. Um, yeah, all right. And so, so we, have, we have changed these two parameters, right, architecture and, and uh, uh, augmentations. And we are already close to the 0 0.771 uh, metric on, on our uh, validation data set. So we have, we have made a jump from 0 0.3 to 0 0.7, just changing the architecture and uh, their augmentations. But of course, uh, you're not limited uh, only to, to these settings. So you, you could uh, go further and improve on your model. And one of the simplest uh, things that, that you, could, you, you could do right away is uh, you could take our final best model and you could retrain it on the full uh, trained data available. So beforehand, we have allocated this 15% of validation data for our like, evaluation, local evaluation of the model. But now what we could do, we could combine our trained data with this validation data and retrain the model again. And it allows us to get uh, the more data and, and hopefully obtain the better test, re uh, test metric results. And here you could see that, that it improved by, 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 by seven points. And overall, it took us like 86 uh, models, 86 experiments to go from our baseline 0.3 to this final 0.74 metric. And yeah, I will just quickly show you how it looks like uh, in, in uh, Hydrogen Torch. So I have an instance, all right, so some scaling. Um, yeah, so here, here we have see, see this, this list of 86 experiments we, we have trained. And you could also uh, sort them by, by this validation metric. 
Uh, but apart from that, you, you could also improve on top of these experiments, right? So you, you could select uh, one of the best experiments, uh, click new experiment, uh, start from it, and here you might uh, tune some, some other parameters. So, so for now, they are fixed to what we have found works the best. So we have this medium augmentations with mix up, we have our NFNet as, as a backbone. But for example, you, you might enable the grid search and you might want to maybe change their uh, d d different optimizers. So you might select instead of like this atomw you have, uh, you might select uh, SGD as well. And you might try to ma maybe improve the model on top. So it means that this, as I said, this process is endless, right? And and you have a bunch of other parameters uh, that, that you would like to choose. However, uh, once you are uh, happy with your model, uh, you can uh, explore it and uh, again look look at some some prediction insights and, and see that everything work, works well. And afterwards, you uh, you can deploy this model. And for the deployment, we have three options uh, here uh, at, in Hydrogen Torch. So the first one is just predict. Uh, for this purpose, you need to upload your test data set to the application and just run predict on, on, on your new test data set in, in the application. And apart from that, we have two external deployments. Uh, one is scoring pipeline and another one is MLOps. And I will switch to slides to quickly talk about them. Um, so basically, the first option is called H2 MLOps, and it allows you to uh, easily deploy the models to a REST API service. So it means that, that, that you, you're just uploading uh, it to our uh, another cloud cloud application, and here at, at the bottom you can see the screenshot where you have your deployment, and you could just send the API requests from any environment you have. You can send your, your images, and you could get, get predictions back uh, from, uh, from, uh, from the model deployed. However, uh, it doesn't suit the use case when, when you need a real-time inference. So it, it, it suits well when you have like batch, batch inference that might be slow. But if you really need fast uh, real-time inference, then we have another option that is called Python Scoring Pipeline. And it allows you to download the will package, uh, the, the Python will package that you could install in any Python environment and basically run it on GPU and CPU on the same machine where the, where the data resides, for example. And it makes it much more faster uh, to, to, uh, to run the inference. And we don't have the options here to uh, deploy the models directly on the device. So for example, in this ca camera use case, you might think that maybe we can deploy the models directly on the cameras, right? And, and run real-time inference on, on, on the cameras itself. Um, however, what we are, we are, we are hearing like from, from our prospects and from our customers is that currently with the involvement of 5G network, it is really uh, fast to, to transfer the data between the device and, and some data centers. And now, uh, under the edge deployment, some people mean uh, like the real edge deployment on the device where you have your models running on their mobile device. But some people mean uh, under the edge deployment is deployment to some data centers that are close to your users. So they're located like around the city, for example. And it is like a kind of small GPU boxes uh, where the models, uh, models reside. And with, with 5G network, it is really fast to transfer the data from the device to this uh, cl uh, nearby uh, server and run the inference there. And it allows you to use much, much larger models and run them on GPU instead of like uh, really uh, small, small mobile devices uh, that you have in hands. Um, yeah, and just, uh, just to finish my presentation today, I will show you how this model works on some kind of like videos in the wild. So here you could see a, a clip from, from London. So, so it is completely in another city, right, with another cameras. And uh, in London, uh, you have an opportunity to download like small 10 seconds clips from, from city cameras. And here, here, here we are running the inference of this model uh, on, 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 on this uh, small, small t uh, 10 seconds video. And here you can see on the right that it is making pretty good job at detecting their uh, like bouncing boxes around the cars. But apart, apart from, from just detecting the boxes, we are, for example, added here uh, the, the, uh, the tracker on top. So we are not, not, now not only like detecting the, the objects, right, but what we might also uh, track w what was the, the uh, like specific car ID that uh, was passing by. And it allows us to, to count, for example, unique vehicles th that were passing by through the camera today. Um, yeah, all right. So that's, that's, that's it for, 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 for these topics. Thank you. Thank you for, for your attention.